Welcome to Power for Today Prophetic Ministries with George Della. I want to welcome everybody to our Tuesday night Bible study. We've been looking at the uh, dunamis power of God and, and the transformation that God's trying to bring to raise up his glorious church and his holy bride and preparing us for the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to get into the word in just a moment. I want to have a prayer first. Uh, I want to welcome everybody on Facebook Live as well as free conference call. And uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Just ask God to, to uh, lead and guide us into the word of God and, and to uh, anoint that word to work effectually in our lives. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I want to thank you for this day you've given to us. I, I thank you for your mercies that are new every morning, your abundant grace that you poured upon us every day. Oh, Lord, I just thank you for your goodness and uh, uh, your loving kindness, Lord, that you show towards your people uh, every day of our lives. And so, Lord God, I want to thank you for this time. As we get into your word tonight, I pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit will come and uh, open the word to our understanding, that he would anoint it to work effectively in us, to produce your kingdom in us, because you get your church ready and prepared for the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we just look unto you to, to direct us, instruct us, teach us, uh, anoint the word, and uh, bring forth God's perfect will this night. Direct all things, instruct all things, teach all things, and anoint all things according to his will and purpose. We declare today in the name of Jesus that the glory of God cover this earth like the waters cover the sea, that uh, we, we call down the fire, we call down the rain, we call down the, the revival to come down upon this earth once again in Jesus' name. As he tells us in, in uh, uh, the book of Psalms that uh, the glory of the, of the Lord is going to fill this earth uh, like the waters cover the sea. So we're looking for that day that uh, God's going to move mightily and powerfully. I believe it's already starting. We're seeing pockets of revival waking out and different uh, breaking out in different areas uh, in the U.S. and overseas. Uh, people are awakening up and uh, and responding to the to the gospel. And we need the church to wake up. We need the church to get serious. We need the, as Romans Paul says about the Romans for the manifestation of the sons of God. Come forth, the people, the soldiers of God, the the, the the anointed ones, the crucified ones, the separated ones, the sanctified ones, the, the sons of glory. They're going to carry the glory of God to the nations and uh, bear those uh, fires of revival wherever they go. Amen. I believe God is moving. He's calling us. He's shaking everything in heaven, everything on earth. And uh, uh, I'm just believing God to be a part of what he's doing glorious church to be prepared for the bride of Christ to make herself ready. And uh, I just call forth the ecclesia, the true church of Jesus Christ, to rise up and shine. That the church would rise with the glory of the Lord risen upon them, reveal his salvation and reveal his righteousness. Uh, the kings and Gentiles be drawn to the brightness of his rising, that uh, the church will, will, will uh, rise up and, and shout from the rooftops. Amen. Get ready. Get ready, get ready. People need to get ready. Look for the fire. Look for the, 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 the Holy Spirit to really move in these last days. And uh, I'm telling you what, God's going to have a church, amen, and he's going to have a harvest uh, for people to be prepared, watching and waiting uh, for the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I believe that harvest is getting ready to, ready to happen. And so we need to get ready too, amen. I can hear the sound of rain. Uh, I'm I, just looking at Elijah. He's up on the mountain. God told him it's going to get ready to rain. He got up on the mountain. He got down. He began to pray and uh, watching and waiting for God to fulfill his word. And the seventh time, the servant came back to him and says, I see a cloud the size of a man's fist. You know what Elijah did? He says, let's get down really quick. Get down. The rain is coming. And so uh, Elijah uh, got down off that mountain. I'll tell you what, the church needs to get down off the mountain and get down into the valley of decision. There are souls to, to, to be reached. There are souls that need to be saved. There's a work to be done. Amen. So we need to get serious and become the people that God has called us to be in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Praise God. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Power for Today Prophetic Ministries with George Dello. And we're going to get into the word tonight. and. Uh, talking about uh, the preparation of the glorious church and the dunamis power of God, the power of God that works to make us that, that church that uh, he has called forth in these last days 
that's going to bring the glory of God upon this earth. It's going to bring in a mighty harvest of souls. And uh, it, it's going to see God's manifest presence on this earth as never before. Uh, amen. And that's what, uh, uh, that's what excites me. That's what I want to see. I, I want to see God's manifestation. I've seen the glory of God. I've experienced the glory of God. I've seen miracles, signs, and wonders over the years. I've seen blind eyes uh, open. I've seen uh, uh, people get up out of wheelchairs. Uh, after uh, uh, one, one man, 17 years in a wheelchair, got up and walked. Amen. I've seen uh, 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 cysts just disappear. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Amen. Because that's who God is. He's a God of power. He's a God of healing and deliverance. And God wants to reveal himself upon this earth. Listen. God's not willing that any should perish, but all will come to repentance. That's his heart. He came. He sent Jesus to do what? To seek and save that which is lost. And one way to reach the lost is to manifest his presence upon this earth, that they will believe. They'll be, they'll be shaken. They'll be stirred. They'll, 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 they'll be awakened uh, that they need to do something. We're living in the days where we're seeing things happen upon this earth we never would have dreamed of. But I want to tell you something. In Luke, I mean, he talks about the last days. He, he said, when you see all these signs taking place that, that are pointing to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, let it be a time of testimony. Why? Because the hearts of men are failing them. All these things coming down upon this earth, and they're open. They're looking for answers. They're open to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we got to get, get busy and do the things that God has called us to do uh, to bring in that last great harvest before the coming of, of Jesus Christ. So... Uh, uh, let's get excited about that. Amen. Well, listen, I want to get uh, pick up where I left off last time. We've been talking about, again, God's preparing his church. And it all has to do with the, the holiness of God, the sanctification of God, and what Jesus came to do on the cross of Calvary to make us that glorious church. That when he comes back, he's going he's to present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she should be holy and blameless. That's the church he's coming back for. And so if we're going to be, uh, if we're, we're, we're waiting for him to come, we need to be ready for his coming, meaning that we need to be a part of that glorious, that holy church. If, if we're not uh, living and walking in that place with God, uh, like the foolish virgins, they weren't ready. And uh, when Jesus came back, they were left out. The door was shut. It was too late. Okay? We need to be the wise servants that... Uh, are uh, 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 growing every day, and uh, we're, we're busy doing the things of God. We're in the Word. We're in prayer. We're doing the, uh, making disciples. We're, we're, we're worshipers of God. We're living the life of holiness, walking in, in, in righteousness, and uh, being the church that God called us to be. Because, again, how are we going to bring in the harvest? The harvest comes in when the church arises and shines. And I just did a whole uh, series on, on what that means. The light is righteousness. When we reveal the righteousness of God upon this earth, that's what draws the lost. And so we've got to be that church uh, that's going to draw the lost. So let's look at this. Uh, tonight I want to begin to look into this area of the, the blood of sacrifice, the blood that purifies, the blood that cleanses, and uh, how we get to that place so that we can be ready, we can be the people that God's called us to be, okay? Now in the Old Testament, the means of purification was the blood of animals, amen? The old covenant, uh, when when God brought Israel to himself and, and uh, made him his own special people, he gave him the law, and part of that law uh, include all of these sacrifices that they had to make of different animals uh, for the sin of the people, for the, for the, the sin that was committed. And, uh, uh, the, the, and so, and so the, the, the means of purification that they had had to do with the blood of animals. Now, the, the word purification, when we talk about the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, was not, it's not really a, 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 an apt term because uh, it didn't actually purify their sin. It just covered their sin. They didn't have the means to actually purify them from sin. So the blood of the animals covered the sins of the people. In other words, it was a ritualistic uh, covering. Where God, whereby God, God forgave them, but God overlooked their sin uh, because of the blood of those animals, and uh, that allowed the people to approach God in worship. So the blood averted the wrath of God as they followed the law, as they 
They went through these ritualistic sacrifices every day, morning and evening. And every year they had the Day of Atonement where the, all of Israel would come together and they would confess their sins. And, and, uh, and it, was, it was then that the, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and, and take that blood into the Holy of Holies for the sins of himself and the sins of Israel. And they'd have to do that every year. And then every day they had to offer these sacrifices because, again, the sin was never taken away because the blood of bulls and goats could not actually remove the sin. It just served as a covering. It was a temporary fix until the coming of the fullness of time when God would send the permanent fix and he would bring the answer to their need which was Jesus Christ, amen? So, so the blood of birth of the wrath of God and then all of those rites and ceremonies of law, they required blood to deal with the sin of man. Now remember, we're dealing with sin on two levels, okay? Uh, Paul talks about uh, uh, we, we, we are considered, uh, set, we're dead in sin because of both what we do, but also by who we are, what is in us. We are born in sin, so we're doubly dead. In, in Colossians, he puts it this way, uh, we are dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of our hearts. Okay, so we're doubly dead. So we're dealing with this with this sin. And uh, when it came to, to purification, the Old Testament, when it came to cleansing, not, not, not talking about forgiveness, but cleansing because people were defiled by sin. They were corrupted by sin. Or for instance, if they touch, touch a dead body, then they were considered unclean. Okay? So what they had then was what they called the water of, of purification, which was made from the, 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 the from a red heifer that was killed, and the, the blood and, and uh, ashes were mixed together with some other things to make this water of purification. So when he was unclean, he had to be sprinkled with the water of, of purification to make them clean again. And again, all of this was ritualistic. It didn't actually do anything in a physical way. Okay, but this is what God gave them to deal with their sin and their sinfulness so that God could be dwell there with his people and they can maintain this relationship with him, even though they there was a separation between them and God. God had to dwell in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle uh, apart from the people and nobody could come near him except once again, the, the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. He would come in there with the blood, and again, uh, even then, he had to make sure he did everything right. In fact, tradition tells us that he actually he had bells on his uh, clothing so that they could hear him, know that when he's moving around, and know that he's alive. And then it also tells us that they would tie a rope on his leg because if he went in and uh, uh, was unworthy, uh, he would die. They'd have to drag him out. They couldn't go in to get him. They'd have to drag him out. Uh, if something like that happened. So so uh, even then, the, the people could not, uh, even though they had all these sacrifices and all this animal blood that was shed for them, the people could not uh, come into the Shekinah presence of God in the Holy of Holies. It, it would kill them because of their sinfulness. And they could not have an intimate abiding relationship with the Lord. So, so this is why uh, again, only the high priest could could enter through that veil once a year, and only again after going through this elaborate ceremony of purification. And uh, uh, and so this is why, again, uh, under the old covenant, uh, Israel uh, could not have the indwelling Holy Spirit because there was no way, there was no means for them to. Uh, have their temple, their body cleansed from the inward sin so that uh, the Holy Spirit could dwell in them. So only a practical righteousness produces an abiding intimacy with God. Amen. Let me bring up my uh, PowerPoint for you. Uh, you can follow along here. But let's look at this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Notice it says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked, okay? Uh, in other words, he, he's talking about under this new covenant, God has called us into this intimate relationship whereby we become one with God. 
and uh, that means that we're in God and God is in us. We're in the Father, the Father's in us. We're in the, we're in the uh, Christ, Christ is in us. We're in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in us. And we become intimately, intimately uh, entwined with him, mutually indwelling each other. And we come into this personal, intimate relationship. When you're born again, when you're truly saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and, and uh, repentance and faith, uh, God puts his Holy Spirit in you. And, and we, we enter into that, that personal uh, oneness with God. Now, you'll discover as you look through the scriptures that that word abiding, which means remaining. In other words, uh, when, 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 when we come into that relationship, that's supposed to be a permanent relationship. We don't come and go. Amen. We're not in Christ today and out tomorrow. It's supposed to be an abiding relationship whereby we remain in him. He remains in us. But again, it's based on a covenant relationship, and that's why uh, John tells us, he who says he abides in him, in other words, if we claim that we're in Christ and Christ is us, there ought to be evidence. And the evidence is that we walk the way that Jesus walked. In other words, we live a life, okay, that reflects the image of God in righteousness and holiness. So you'll, you'll discover that throughout the scriptures, that abiding, if you look up the word abiding, it is always directly uh, related to obedience, okay? To abide means that you obey, okay? Now, again, we're not talking about uh, a gospel of works, okay? We're not saying that obedience saves you. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is obedience is the result of being saved. Obedience is the evidence that you've been truly born again that you've been washed and sanctified and justified in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of God. That's what we're talking about. That produces a new creation. That produces a change within you that makes you a new creation. And so you begin, because you have a brand new nature and God has removed the sin from you, you can now walk in newness of life. You can now walk as Jesus walked. You can reveal the nature and character of Christ through you on a practical level. Okay? Practical intimacy with God is based on a practical holiness. That's why uh, Peter tells us that, uh, 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 but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Okay? Notice what Peter says when he, when, when, when he uh, 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 call, talks about this holiness. It's not on some, you know, some here, here by, you know, an unreal a place. It is a practical reality uh, in our lives. So Peter says, because uh, he who called you is holy, you have to be holy. And what does it say? In all your conduct. Okay. And uh, uh, Jesus himself said on the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. You'll find that word perfect and holy are really synonymous because it has to do uh, with this uh, uh, idea of completeness that we uh, that we obtain through the saving work of Jesus Christ. So it's our practical walk in righteousness that reveals a practical abiding in Christ. It's our practical holiness in Christ which allows for God's habitation within us. And I was talking about this on Sunday morning. Uh, if you study the tabernacle and uh, how it was built in, the, in, in Exodus, it, is all the details of how the uh, tabernacle was raised up and everything that had to be done in order to, to make that tabernacle and to make it perfectly according to the plan of God and to do it in such a way that everything was purified, everything was holy, everything was cleansed okay, before God could come and dwell in that Holy of Holies. Okay, Well, when you really study that and understand that that is a picture, that is a shadow, that is a type of what Christ was coming to do in us. God cannot dwell in us until we are prepared, even as that tabernacle was, to become a holy vessel, okay, whereby there's no sin, no uncleanness, no corruption in us, but everything's been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Everything's been washed and sanctified. Everything has been put in order through the redeeming work of Christ. He does it all. It's all uh, by grace through faith. He does all that work to make us fit. So then he, he, he takes the sin out of us. He cuts off the stony heart of, 
of, of sin and flesh. He gives us a new heart, a new spirit. We partake of the divine nature of God. And then when everything's been cleansed and purified, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in this temple. Amen. And what does he do? He empowers us to now walk in obedience to God. That's why, again, the evidence that we're truly born again, the evidence that we are abiding in Christ and Christ in us is that we live a life of obedience. As John says, uh, we walk the way Jesus walked. Uh, we live a life unto God to glorify him, to obey him, to love him, to serve him, amen, to, to worship him. In other words, our whole life is, is, is devoted uh, unto God uh, because he bought, him, uh, bought us with a price of his own son's blood. We belong to him, and so we live a life unto him. So he makes it possible for us to actually do that. He works all of those things in us so that we can be that holy temple. Now, God desires a place of habitation to be a permanent abiding place. He doesn't want to come and go. Amen. This, again, is one of the, the things that uh, we fail to understand. And uh, if you read Romans chapter 6, Paul kind of lays it out that uh, when God separates us from sin, when he delivers us out of the kingdom of darkness and brings him into his kingdom, and we become dead to sin, we become alive to God. And what that means is we, we should no longer have a relationship with sin. We now have an abiding relationship with the Lord. We live in unbroken fellowship with the Father the same way that Jesus did, okay? That's what it comes down to. Ezekiel uh, talks of God's desire to set up a sanctuary in the midst of his people. In Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, verse 26 and 27, notice what Ezekiel tells us. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So here we can see this is God's purpose uh, from the beginning of time. And so when God brought Israel to be his own special people, that his, the purpose never changed. Okay? His purpose was that he would be their God, that he, they would be his people. And God's desire was that he would dwell with them forever. Okay? And so God needs a holy place to set up his holy tabernacle. So again, uh, we see that with the uh, tabernacle of the wilderness. And then we see the same thing when Solomon built a permanent temple in Jerusalem where God would dwell uh, with Israel in that uh, temple in Jerusalem. And again, in the Holy of Holies, still separated from the people because they could not experientially be made holy. Okay, Now, this has always been God's desire from the beginning of time. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, you'll find the same thing, the tabernacle in the wilderness, the temple of Solomon. God's desire has always to be to dwell with his people. So we see God walking in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve, fellowshipping with them. And uh, now remember now, before Adam sinned, they, they, they were clean. They were righteous. They were innocent. There was no sin in them. So God could walk with them. God could be there with them in their presence uh, without an issue because there was no sin in them. But once Adam and Eve sinned, God had to drive them out of the Garden of Eden. And ever since that time, because man was corrupted by that sin, and all of us are corrupted because of that sin passes down through the seed of, of uh, uh, Adam to all, all of us. Okay? So, so God uh, has to have this separation between us and his people. So again, with Israel, when he calls Israel to be his own special people, there had to be this separation, and that was the purpose of the tabernacle with the Holy of Holies and then the Temple of Solomon with the Holy of Holies. So God's desire is to have a permanent habitation in the midst of his people. Like, uh, uh, like Ezekiel said, an everlasting covenant set uh, uh, my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. In other words, I will always be with my people. And, every, and again, when we get to the revelation, when everything is said and done, that is exactly what we find. Uh, uh, we will dwell with God forever. And again, he declares, uh, I will be, I, I am your God and you will be my people. 
And it all comes down to the same thing. Now, the problem was in the Old Testament, every time the people fell into idolatry and sin, guess what? God departed or God drove them uh, into captivity. Uh, you know, somehow God had to deal with that sin. And ultimately, uh, what happened was God had to leave the tabernacle. He departed from it forever. And then ultimately, even with the tabernacle or the uh, temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, uh, after uh, the, the people again sinned against God, and we're talking about over and over again. We're not talking about a one-time mistake. We're talking about over and over again. If you read through the, the Old Testament, you'll find this was a continual pattern. And uh, uh, the, the people would, uh, would sin. Uh, God would uh, judge them and drive them into captivity or bring some kind of judgment on them. The people would repent, come back to God, ask for forgiveness. God would restore that relationship. But it came to, a, came to a point in each situation where God deserted the tabernacle of the wilderness and never went back into it. The same thing, God deserted the temple in Jerusalem and never returned to it again. So, uh, again, why? Because God cannot abide in the midst of sin. God is holy. That's what Peter was talking about. You have to be holy because God is holy. And the only way we can be one with God, the only way that we can. Uh, uh, be in union with God as we have to be like him. Amen. God doesn't come down to our level. He brings us up to his level. Okay. God, God, God doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, come down to our level of, of sin and, and, and unfaithfulness. He brings us up to his level of obedience and faithfulness. And he does it again through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ to make us holy, to make us righteous in a real and practical way through that uh, uh, work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. So the same holds true for us, both individually and corporately, because again, God's purpose has never changed. God's desire has never changed, okay? He desires a holy habitation for an abiding place, but again, he will not abide in the midst of our sin and idolatry, okay? So uh, this is what Jesus was talking about. Uh, uh, we have to understand why he came and what he came to do so that we can have this intimacy with God. And again, uh, in the New Testament, under this, under this new covenant of Jesus Christ, God is bringing, about, bringing it all about to another level. When he talks about this intimacy with him, he's bringing it to another level, a practical level whereby God not just is with us, not just in uh, the same area like with Israel, but God literally indwells each one of his people and he indwells his church. Okay? Paul talks about in, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, how God, he, he comes to do what? Walk among us, but also dwell within us. Okay? So he indwells each of us individually, but he walks among us uh, corporately to manifest his presence and power uh, in the church. So that people would believe and, and God can, can uh, uh, manifest himself in ways to edify the, and build up the church as well as, as bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, So let's look at this in John chapter 8 verse 34 to 36 and see what Jesus tells us concerning why, uh, uh, what he came to do so that we can have this intimate relationship. We can abide in Christ and Christ in us. Okay? It is all based on what Jesus came to do. So Jesus tells us, number one, to continue in sin is to be a slave to sin. In other words, if we have sin in us, okay, what's going to happen? That sin is going to manifest itself in sins that we commit. Okay? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Okay? Now he's not talking about making a mistake. He's not talking about slipping up. He's talking about uh, areas of sin, whereby we are always doing things. Uh, we have a we have these uh, habitual sins in our lives, and again, we look at the modern day church. We we can see this very plainly. People literally literally living in lives of sin, and yet professing Jesus Christ to be their Lord. Well, they're inconsistent, and they don't go together. And notice what Jesus tells us here. Okay. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. In other words, 
You are under the power of that sin. It controls you. That's why you commit sin. That's why you do the things that you do. That's why you keep going back to the same things you go back and, and keep doing the same things you do. Why? Because you're enslaved to that sin. Now notice what Jesus says next. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. In other words, if you're a slave of sin, you will not get into the kingdom of God. You cannot remain uh, in uh, the kingdom of God. And, and again, uh, you have to look at this in two different ways. Okay, if a person is not born again, they're enslaved to sin, but they're not in the house. <laughs> Amen. But there are times where people come to Christ, they repent, they, they put their faith in Christ. God comes, he does this work, he cleanses them. He makes them a son, and so uh, uh, they they come into the kingdom of God. They come into God's house. Okay, but what happens uh, if they go back into sin and they're overcome by that sin? If they yield to temptation and uh, yield themselves back into sin, they, they, they overcomes them. They become a slave to sin again. And you can read this in Second Peter chapter two. That whole chapter is about people that that has happened to. Okay, so he tells them. You are not going to abide in the house forever. If you're going to continue in sin, that sin is going to overcome you. You're going to become enslaved to that, that sin. And what will happen is you will depart from God. Okay. Now notice what Jesus says. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. What's the difference? A son is who? What does what, what uh, 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 the book of John tell us? Uh, who the sons of God are, okay? In uh, uh, John chapter 1, he, he tells us, uh, uh, verse 12, but as many as received him, he to them he gave the right to become children of God or sons of God to those who believe in his name. And watch this who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, okay? So in other words, the sons of God are those who have been born of God, amen? They've been born of God through their, again, repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Now notice what Jesus says here, okay? Uh, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Okay, how does he make us free? He makes us free through his redeeming work, amen, when he saves us. To be born again is to be set free from sin. It's part of that work of sanctification, part of that work that God uh, works in us to make us holy. It's the washing of the blood of the Lamb to remove all that sin from our hearts, from our minds, our bodies. We are made completely uh, 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 clean from all sin. He forgives us of what we've done, and he washes us from the corruption of that sin in us. So Jesus tells us, okay, if you are living in sin, then uh, you get to that place where you're enslaved to that sin. You will not remain in his house forever, but a son, one who has received the full redemptive work of Christ, and walks in obedience to God, is not enslaved to sin anymore, been set free, they're dead to sin, and living a life unto God, walking, as we said earlier, abiding in Christ, walking as Jesus walked, living as Jesus walked in righteousness and in truth, okay, he will abide forever. He will remain in Christ forever as long as he lives that life uh, of obedience uh, by faith, uh, living a life of faith in Jesus Christ day by day and allowing the Holy Spirit to keep him walking in that place of righteousness and truth. Amen. Now, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. What's he make us free from? He makes us free from sin. Amen. And what does that mean? Free indeed. It means you have been completely, perfectly, and forever set free. The only way, again, that <laughs> That, that you're going to go, go back into sin is if you make a willful choice to yield to uh, uh, sin by uh, uh, giving yourself over uh, to that sin again, okay? 
uh, you have to make a conscious decision to do that. That's why Paul talks about in Romans uh, chapter 6. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Do not present your members. Don't present yourself as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, okay? But present yourself, uh, 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 I'm sorry, unrighteous to sin. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God, okay? Verse 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves who you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? In other words, what Paul is saying is once God sets us free, when Jesus Christ makes us free, we're free indeed. Now we have to live a life by faith in Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit will lead us and keep us in obedience to God, in that place of righteousness, we don't yield to, to sin. We don't, we don't present ourselves uh, back to sin. We're done with sin. We yield ourselves as instruments of righteousness to walk uh, uprightly before God and do the things that God wants us to do as the Holy Spirit empowers us to do that. Amen. So Jesus did not sacrifice himself on the cross of Calvary in order to make us slaves of sin or to leave us in that condition of being slaves to sin. And let me tell you something. This is a real serious issue in the modern day church because so many people don't understand this whole concept that I'm talking about right here. And so uh, they, they literally tell people it's okay uh, to live in sin because God understands. Uh, and in fact, they even preach that people will continue uh, to live in sin the rest of their days until they die or Jesus comes. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. Notice what Jesus just said. If the Son makes you free, you're free indeed. What does that mean to be free indeed? It means you no longer live a life of sin. You're no longer sin slave to sin. Sin is not your slave master. Sin doesn't control you anymore. Amen. The Holy Spirit controls you. Praise God. Amen. Jesus came to set us free that we not be slaves, but we be sons, the sons of God that abide in Christ, that walk a life of obedience. We walk like Jesus walked. There is no abiding relationship with a slave. Only a son remains in the house forever. Amen. Only those who are set free from the power of sin are led by the Holy Spirit as the true sons of God. Notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Those that are led by the Spirit of God. Let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit is God. And let me say this, let me, let me make it even more clear. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. The Holy Spirit is a Holy Spirit, meaning what? He's holy. He will never lead you in sin. He will never lead you contrary to the voice, to the will, to the character, to the nature of God. He will never leave you, lead you in anything but righteousness and holiness because he's holy. Amen. If you are being led by the Spirit of God, as a son or daughter of God, he's never going to lead you in a wrong way. He's never going to lead you into temptation. He's never going to lead you into sin and disobedience. He'll never do that. Okay? But again, we have to live a life of abiding, remaining. You have to live and walk with a God consciousness every day. Amen. Like Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me, the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. In other words, we have to live our lives by faith every moment of every day, following God, following the voice of the Holy Spirit as He leads us in God's will and His purpose. And we live a life holy and, and, and holy, uh, a complete devotion and dedication to God to please Him, to serve Him, to love Him, to obey Him. The Holy Spirit is going to lead us in the things of God. 
He's going to lead us to be in the Word. He's going to lead us in worship. He's going to lead us in making disciples. He's going to lead us uh, in, in prayer. Everything that we have, everything we're to be about, the Holy Spirit is there as our helper, okay? Our teacher, our instructor. He's there to, to empower us and to help us to walk like Jesus walked, okay? That's why Jesus sent him in the first place, amen? So to be a son is to be delivered from sinful flesh. Paul relates carnality to being uh, 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 under the power of sin. Carnal individuals are led by the lust of the flesh rather than being led by the spirit. So if a person is in the church and they are living in willful known sin, what does that tell us? Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. What does it tell us if they're living in willful known sin? They're not being led by the Spirit of God. They're being led by the lust of the flesh. Now, notice what Paul tells us uh, what happens if that is the case. In Romans uh, uh, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 5, notice what Paul says. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. In other words, those who are living in sin, those who are committing sin, are slaves of sin. And what does that mean? What do they do? How do they live their life? They live a life according to the flesh, setting their minds on the things of the flesh. In other words, they live a life seeking to satisfy the lust of their flesh, seeking to do things that's going to satisfy that lust, whatever it may be, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, whatever area that the devil's got a hold of them, they're going to live a life seeking to satisfy that flesh, that lust, okay? So what does Paul say? But those who live according to the Spirit, in other words, those who are being led by the Spirit of God, they don't live after the lust of the flesh. They don't live a life looking, setting their minds on, on satisfying the lust of the flesh. No, Paul says, those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. In other words, those that live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. They live a life to please the Holy Spirit, to obey the voice of the Holy Spirit, to, to, to go and do the things that the Holy Spirit leaves them. And again, to abide in God, to abide in Christ by the Holy Spirit means that it's a 24-7 thing. We, we don't just call upon God or look to the guides of God or be led by the Spirit, you know, on Sunday morning or Wednesday night or once in a while. It is a continual lifestyle. That's the word abide means, to abide, to remain, to stay fixed. Amen. We stay, we keep our minds and hearts stayed on the Holy Spirit, being led by him in all things. We're always have, walking with that God consciousness, listening for the voice of God, listening to his conviction, listening to his direction. When we begin to move in a wrong way, what does Isaiah say? He says, you'll hear a word behind you saying this is the way. Walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand or to the left. How does that happen? When we start moving in the direction of disobedience or sin, the Holy Spirit begins to move. He begins to speak with conviction to tell you, don't do that. Don't go that way. Okay? That's what he's there doing. And if we obey him, if we keep our, our, our focus on him and, 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 and depend upon him to give us the strength to not go that way, okay, he will keep us in the way of righteousness. He will lead us in the way that we need to go. But again, this is a lifestyle. To be led by the Spirit is a lifestyle. To abide in Christ is a lifestyle. It's not living in Christ, but in Christ when we're doing what is right, when we're living a life of righteousness and holiness, and then we turn around and can go into sin and live a life of sin and fulfill the lust of our flesh, okay? It doesn't work that way. We have to abide. We have to remain. We don't come and go. We stay in that relationship with him by doing what? By, by being led by the Spirit of God, keeping our minds stayed upon him, keeping our minds stayed on the things of the Spirit. Jesus came to set us free indeed, to set us free from some sin and flesh, 
that we might become sons of God that walk by faith, being led by the Spirit of God. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed, completely and permanently. Again, as long as Paul says, we don't yield ourselves, we don't submit ourselves back to sin, we don't yield our members to, to, to go back into bondage to sin, we yield our members to righteousness, to walk with God in obedience and uh, to his ways. Amen. And look, these are the kind of scriptures that you need to meditate on, that you need to, to, to get inside of you. Because like Jesus says, how does he set you free? If you abide in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Okay. If we're not in this word, if we're not studying, if we're not meditating, if we're not getting this word inside of us, okay, you're never going to get into this place of uh, an abiding relationship with God, whereby we can live out this life of righteousness and holiness. We have to get into this place, and then we have to live in it. We have to abide in it. We have to remain in it 24-7, every day of the week. We live a life of obedience to God. When you look at the early church, that's what they did. Okay, when I'm talking about the early church before it got corrupted and people were bringing this stuff into the church. And then Paul particularly had to correct them, had to deal with them, trying to bring sin into the church or thinking that they could continue to live a life of sin and be saved. Paul rebukes them. He corrects them. He deals with those things. Why? Because that is not normal Christianity. That's what uh, uh, especially the book of Romans is all about. Paul tells them, you need to understand what Jesus did. You need to understand what he uh, redeemed us from, what he brought us into, and then you need to walk, to live in that life of the Spirit so that you don't go back into bondage. You don't go back into that old way. You don't go back into the kingdom of darkness. You don't go back to that lust of the flesh. You live a life in the Spirit. You abide in Christ day and night, every day. And again, you look at the example of Paul in the New Testament. You look at the early church. I mean, 3,000 people got saved on the day of Pentecost. And notice what he says. They continued every day in the things of God. They were in the word. They were in prayer. They were in fellowship. Uh, they, they, they had church pretty much every day. They were doing the works of God. They were sharing the gospel. They worshiped God. God worked signs and wonders in their midst. They, they, they sold what they have to make sure the, the poor uh, were, were supplied with what they need. I mean, they lived the life day by day, every day. Why? Because when they were redeemed, when they were saved, God delivered them, completely set them free from all sin and unrighteousness. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed and brought them into this newness of life. And they lived a life in the Holy Spirit. And they did it to such a degree that most of them, very many of them, many of them were martyred for their faith. They died for being faithful, living a life of holiness and faithfulness to God. They gave their lives in terrible deaths uh, uh, to, 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 to live that relationship, that abiding place with him. Because, again, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. We need to get back to this. We need to get the church uh, uh, back to where we live the same way, that we are a, we a people of the Holy Spirit. And we walk and live a life. We walk like Jesus walked. We abide in him. We remain in him. We stay in him because we've been set free. And now we live a life of unbroken relationship. And uh, uh, we live a life in obedience to God. Let's look at this uh, real quick. And then I'm going to have to, uh, oh, geez, it's almost an hour. I'm going to have to shut down. Let me give you one more, one more thing in this, okay? Jesus uh, exemplifies this work of the cross that has to be appropriated by us in order to bring us into this abiding relationship with God. So let's look at this in Romans uh, chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. Notice what he says. For by the death he died, talking about Jesus, by the death he died, he died to sin. I'm reading this from the Amplified so you can see clearly what he is saying. By the death he died, he died to sin, ending his relation to it once for all. Once for all. In other words, it was finished. It was done. It was over. Okay. Jesus is explaining to us what he did for us. Okay. So the death he died, he died to sin, ending his relationship to it once for all, 
and the life that he lives, he is living to God in unbroken fellowship with him. That right there is the gospel. That's what God has called every single one of us into, okay? Every truly born again son and daughter of God, every son and daughter of God, just live by the Spirit of God. This should be your life. You die once for all. You end your relationship to sin once for all. And the life you now live, you live to God in unbroken fellowship with him. No going back and forth, no in and out, no living with sin one day and then obeying and no. No, you remain, you abide because why? Because whom the Son sets free is free in being completely, perfectly, and forever. So what did he say? Even so, okay, or in the same way, consider yourselves also dead to sin and your relation to it broken. Okay, what's he saying? By faith, we attain the promise. By faith, we attain the promise. We consider ourselves dead to sin and our relationship to sin broken. We don't live in sin anymore. We don't live a life of committing a habitual sin. We don't live that way anymore. Why? Because we have been set free. Our relationship to sin, sin is broken. Amen. We are dead to sin. But what does he say? But alive to God, living in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. We live in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. Amen. So through his death, Jesus ended his relationship with sin once and for all. And the result was a life of unbroken fellowship with his father. In the same manner, we are to attain to the same relationship with God. We must have our relationship with sin completely and forever broken, severed. It's gone. It's finished. It's over. Okay. And how do we do that? It is broken through our identification with the death of Christ. Amen. When we understand the truth that sets us free, that our old man of sin was crucified with Christ in order to deliver us from sin and its power. Okay. That's the faith that takes hold of the promise that brings about the work of God in our life, okay? Our relationship with sin is broken when we identify with his death so that we too can now live in unbroken fellowship unto God. And how do we live that uh, 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 relationship with God, uh, that un unbroken relationship with God? Because we do what? We, uh, we, we, uh, Set our minds not on the things of the flesh, but we set our minds on what? The things of the Spirit. We live listening, hearing, walking with, ever sensitive that God consciousness with the Holy Spirit. That's what it all comes down to, and uh, that's what we need to get back to. That's why I say the only way we're going to become the church that Jesus Christ has called us to be is we need revival. We need God to bring us back to the basics. We need God to give uh, the church a revelation of what Jesus came to do. Because again, uh, we have so many in the church today that don't understand these things. And they're just going on living a life of sin and rebellion and disobedience and uh, thinking that everything's okay because everybody does it. And that's a lie from the pit of hell because again, without holiness, Nobody shall see the Lord. Without holiness, nobody shall get into the kingdom of God. Why? Because it is holiness that produces eternal life. It is holiness that gets us into God's kingdom. Amen. And what is that holiness? Having a pure heart and clean hands. In other words, we don't commit sin anymore. We don't have sin in us anymore. We are set free indeed. And now we live a life of righteous. We like Paul. We have been crucified with Christ. We no longer live. That old man no longer lives. We don't live for ourselves. We don't live for the lust of the flesh. We don't live for sin, okay? We don't live for ourselves anymore. We live by faith in the Son of God. We walk a daily walk of faith, obeying the Holy Spirit as he leads us in a life of righteousness, as he leads us in a life of pleasing unto God. And again, just look at the examples that were given in the New Testament, okay? 
particularly with Paul, because Paul exemplifies, because we have so much information about Paul, much more than anybody else in the New Testament. We have all this information about Paul and the way he lived on a daily basis, the things he went through, and yet Paul didn't go back into sin. Paul lived a life of obedience to God, even when uh, even when it cost him a lot. I mean, being beaten, being shipwrecked, uh, 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 being stoned uh, to death. I mean, he went through imprisonment, you name it. But Paul never backed down. Paul never gave up. Paul never went back into sin. Paul lived a life of faithfulness, of righteousness, of holiness, even to the end when he also was martyred for his faith. Amen. What was Paul doing? Paul lived a life walking like Christ. He lived a life walking just like Jesus. Why? Because he abided in Christ and Christ abided in him. How did he get to that place? Well, read Romans 8. Paul tells exactly what he did. Amen. He was set free. Amen. He was delivered by the work of Christ. Praise God. And uh, he received that work uh, even as he explains it in Romans 6, 7, and 8. He, he tells exactly how he did it, by putting his faith, okay, putting his faith in the truth that set him free, okay? Go to Romans, the, the, the end of Romans 7, what did he say? Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Who can set me free? Oh, wait a minute. Jesus Christ already did it. He already did it. I just need to believe the truth, and the truth sets me free. Paul embraced the full work of Christ. God came and delivered him. He washed him. He filled him with the Holy Spirit. And Paul, from the time he was saved and filled with the Spirit, went forth preaching the gospel, and he lived his entire life from that time on in doing the will of God, preaching this gospel to most of the known world. Paul built most of the churches. Paul raised up tons and tons of Christians. He mentored people. He, he built churches. He gave his life wholly, completely, in dedication to serving God, pleasing God, and living the life of Christ on this earth. So there we have a living example of what is normal Christianity. Amen. That's normal Christianity. What we have is abnormal Christianity because we've got a church that's corrupted. We've got a church that Paul would be sending letters and rebuking us like he did with the Corinthians. Amen. Had to chew them out because they were letting church letting sin go on in the church and weren't dealing with it. We'd be getting the same letters today's church if Paul were alive today and found out what was going on. Amen. We got to get back to the glorious church without spot or blemish or any such thing that should be holy and blameless. We need revival. We need God to pour out the spirit again. We need God to bring a fresh Pentecost upon the church of Jesus Christ. We need God to put the fear of God upon the church and convict us of the wickedness that's in the church and deal with it so that we can get right, go back to the cross, go back to the word of God, get in the truth, get the truth that sets you free and uh, repent and put your faith in Christ for him to do that work and get you right. Because again, we're in the last time, people, we better wake up. We're running out of time. And uh, uh, let me just close with this. Uh, this this one scripture in, in Romans uh, chapter uh, 13, uh, just so you can, uh, uh, you know, talking about the last days, what Paul says here, uh, and, and, and exactly what I'm talking about kind of just sums it up. Notice what Paul says, uh, and do this, uh, Romans uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 11, and do this, knowing the time, knowing the time. Is the Lord pricking your kind Do you sense do you have a sense of the time that we're in? Do you have any sense that the Holy Spirit is moving, is shaking, it is, is, is trying to wake people up? He says, and do this knowing the time that it, now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Okay, This is a prophetic word right here for now. This is a now word. It is time for the church to awake out of sleep for our salvation is nearer when, than when we first believed. In other words, we are one day closer to the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, what, what Paul says, notice what Paul says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, look what Paul said, therefore, because we're getting close, because the signs are all around, we can sense the coming of Christ. We can sense the things that are going on. Paul says, therefore, okay, uh, let us cast off the works of darkness 
and let us put on the armor of white. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. What does Paul say do? You can't live a life of sin and expect to go with Christ when he shows up. He says, you better wake up. You better ask God to wake you out of sleep. You better ask God to convict you. You better ask God to open the eyes of your understanding and show you the truth of your condition that you're not going to get into the kingdom of God if you are continuing to live a life of sin. So what does Paul say? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. In other words, get saved. Get born again. If you're backslidden, go back to the cross. Repent and get it right. Ask God to come, forgive you, and cleanse you again, sanctify you holy, wash you in the blood of Jesus Christ, and give you the revelation of the truth to take hold of the promise for God's work to be done, okay, whereby what? You put on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you put on the Lord Jesus Christ? You put off the old man and put on the new man. God does it through the, through the sanctifying work of Christ by his Holy Spirit. Amen. He removes the stony heart of flesh. He washes everything. He cleanses everything. He gives you a new heart. He gives you a new spirit. And then he puts his Holy Spirit in you. You partake of the divine nature of God. You now have a new nature of righteousness and holiness. So why? So that you can walk according to the fruits of that nature. We become trees of righteousness. Meaning what? We bear the fruits of righteousness. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, when we look at the days, today's charts, Lord, it is a mess. God, help us. God, help us. God, I pray that you wake up your people unto righteousness, Lord God, that they sin not because so many in the church today do not have a true knowledge of you. They don't really know you, and it's evidence because they're living in sin. If they knew you, they would know there's no way you can continue to live in sin in a, in a habitual way and have a right relationship with you. So, God, I pray that you shake everything in the church, shake every tear, shake every lukewarm, shake every deceived, shake every 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 disobedient, shake everything that can be shaken, Lord. Put the fear of God upon them. Wake people out of sleep. Convict us. Convict your church, Lord God. The clean up house. We need to do what Hezekiah did, Lord. When, when Hezekiah became king, what's the first thing he did? He sent the priest in to clean up the temple. He sent them in to do what? Sanctify the temple. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that your church wake up and sanctify the temple, that we go in and clean house, that we call upon the name of Christ in repentance, in humility, in faith, believing that he would come again and sanctify, wash us clean in the blood of the lamb, the blood applied to cleanse our heart, to purify our hearts, to purify our bodies, souls, and spirit, to make us white as snow and to restore us, hallelujah, into newness of life, that we become whiter than snow, we become the true sons and daughters of God, that we can begin to then set our hearts and minds on the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, to be the sons and daughters of God that are led by the Spirit of God. Praise God. I thank you for it, Father. I thank you that you're pouring out your Spirit. I thank you, Father God, right now. I call down the fire. I call down revival. I call down the Holy Ghost. I call down the reign of the Spirit. Lord God, in Jesus' name, do the work, Father. Do the work. Transform your people and make us that glorious church. Make us that holy bride in the name of Jesus Christ. I call forth the church to arise and shine with the righteousness of God in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. And right now, I want to release upon you right now, in Jesus' name, if you're sick, if you're under oppression, if things are going on in your life right now, I speak life into you. I release miracles right now in Jesus' name. I release healing right now into your body, your mind in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, you have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Jesus Christ bore your sickness and disease by the cross of Calvary. He heals you right now in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Rise up. Rise up and be healed in Jesus' name. I speak life into your body, into your mind. Whatever you're dealing with, I command every demon to loose you, every oppressive spirit back into the abyss in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, 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 
I, I speak of life into your body, that every cell, every organ, every tissue of your body will come into agreement with the word of God. By his stripes, you are healed in Jesus' name. I send forth the word of life right now in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, uh, I, I, I want to ask you to, to share this video. Amen. People need to hear the word of God. That's why I preach. I preach word upon word, scripture upon scripture, line upon line. Why? Because it's the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit that's going to change your life. That's going to convict you. That's going to that's going to raise you up to be who you need to be. Amen. And so that's why I preach. People need to hear the word of God. This is the word of God. So please share this video. Tell people they need to come and watch this video. All of my videos are on Facebook. They're also on YouTube. You can just put in my name, George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries. Uh, they'll pop up. And once you get one, they, you know how YouTube works. It brings up another another one. But you can find all of my videos on YouTube. There's hundreds of them on there. And they're all about discipleship. They're all about the, 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 the work of Christ. They're all about making us the people, the glorious church, the holy bride that God is calling forth in this hour to bring in the harvest. It's all the word, the word, the word, the spirit, the spirit, the spirit. Amen. So let me encourage you. Listen, if you're not hearing the spirit in this hour, let me tell you something. Holy Spirit is moving. There, 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 there's, a, there's a sound of rain coming down right now. Listen, the Holy Ghost, he, he's imparted such an urgency in my heart, in my spirit. There's such an urgency of where we are in the scheme of things, in the plans of God for creation. All of these prophecies being fulfilled all around us. All the signs are around us. Time is running out. We are we are, we are, getting closer and closer to, to the coming of a tribulation period, the coming of Christ for his church. All of these things are happening, and there's an urgency that we need to get ready, and that's what I'm trying to do. I am trying to shake people out of sleep. I'm trying to ignite the fire in you. Listen, if you have no sense of urgency, if you're not being shaken by God, if you're not being driven by the Spirit of God to wake up, to get serious, to get in the Word, to get in the face of God, to examine yourself, if you're not sensing anything happening that's changing your life, that's driving you to grow up spiritually, to grow up into your head, Christ Jesus, to, to, to be changed on a daily basis, you need to get on your face. You need to cry out to God in repentance. Ask God to forgive you and ask God to move you, to shake you, to speak into you and to show you what's going on because I'm telling you there's a ton of scriptures all through the New Testament that speak about the last day's church and the majority of the people in the church are not ready when Christ comes. Jesus himself said, many are on the wide road of destruction. You are on the narrow road that leads to eternal life. Himself, Jesus himself said it. Okay? Jesus himself said it. Paul tells us. Peter tells us. Jude tells us. All through the New Testament. When he talks about the last days. He talks about many, many people being deceived, being led astray, going off into sin, getting out of the faith, not ready. When Jesus comes. And that's why there's this urgency. We need to get ready. And the only way to get ready is to get serious. Get in the word. Get in the spirit. Get on your face. Repent. Ask God to do what needs to be done. Amen. So again, this is George Dello, Powerful Today Prophetic Ministries. Thank you for being with me today. I, I, I love you. I appreciate you. I encourage you. Keep looking up. Your redemption draws nigh. We are one day closer to coming to Lord Jesus Christ, and that is a fact you can take to the bank. Amen? So get ready. Get ready. Be ready. Be watching. Be waiting. Doing what God has called us to do. Be making disciples. Revival is coming. There's, a, there's an outpouring of God's Spirit coming upon this earth. You need to be ready. You need to be in position to receive what God is pouring out. Amen? So God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. Again, I will be on seven or, or, or around Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time. I do a Sunday service uh, every month, uh, Sunday morning. And also, I'm popping up here and there because God has put on my heart to really deal with people about how to be a disciple, what it means to, to, to abide in Christ, what it means to walk like Jesus walked, to teach you, to impart, to mentor.
for those of you that are really hungry, that are listening and, and seeking God, this is your opportunity. Just follow me on Facebook and you will be notified every time I bring these things on discipleship so that you can grow in your faith. You can get more and more like Jesus and you can be ready when he comes. So God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord and uh, love you and appreciate you. And I'll see you next time in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.